in terms of environmental racism, once you start looking at what our 3D jobs look like, meaning our dirty, dangerous, and difficult jobs in Ontario or in Canada, you'll see how many of those jobs are actually being carried out by racialized people. And in farm work, there's no, it's, it's no different in farm work. And it's not a coincidence that it's the same racialized bodies that are being exposed to these risky jobs. Welcome to the EcoPolitics Podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Ryan Katsrazine from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for this series is Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University, although he's not joining us for this episode. In this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Andal Gosein, professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University, and Sazna Miranda Leal, a labor rights organizer with Justicia for Migrant Workers and a visual artist. In this episode, we will be talking about the theme of uh, environmental racism and environmental justice in Canada. And these are two uh, intertwined themes, obviously, that are central to the study of ecopolitics. And we wanted to seek Andal and uh, Sazna's help in defining these terms. And we're also hoping that this discussion will help introduce the idea of positionality in the study of ecopolitics, namely the idea that each person's identity, background, and social context within which that is based will shape one's outlook and their understanding of the world. And I think this is important in critical reflections of ecopolitics because it helps us to understand why the field is tended to be framed or interpreted in a particular way. And so in short, the history of environmental management and policy in Canada and even the field of ecopolitics itself, how it's been studied, examined, and its very objectives can also be analyzed in light of environmental racism and environmental justice. Uh, But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're going to take a few steps back and start off with some basic definitions. Andal, you co-wrote a book titled Environmental Justice and Racism in Canada. And perhaps I can ask you to help us start things off by offering a working definition for the term environmental racism for our listeners. Is it a specific form of environmental injustice? So when Cheryl T. Luxing and I wrote that book, we really relied on the definitions put forward by the originators of the term. Um, the first person that's usually identified is a former assistant to Martin Luther King uh, named Dr. Benjamin Chavez. And in 1981, he talked about environmental uh, racism as the intentional siting of hazardous waste sites, landfills, polluting industries and areas inhabited mainly by people of color, indigenous people, migrant farm workers, and low-income people. Hmm. So at the beginning of this, it was really about kind of mapping the terrain of uh, pollution and finding that there was a strong correspondence uh, with exposure to pollution, the lack of regulation, um, and where people, non-white people lived. Hmm. Um, so that's that's sort of the beginning of the term. And then in the 1990s, um, a scholar named Robert Bullard, really uh, his definition, I think, resonated the most broadly and was the one we took up. He sort of widened it to think about uh, environmental racism as any policy practice or directive that uh, differentially affects or disadvantages individuals, groups, or communities based on race or color. And for him, a lot of the question was also about who pays and benefits from it. So where at the beginning we think of environmental justice as, you know, who's not getting clean water? Where are factories being located? Um, Bullard extends it to think about everything about environmental policy and politics. How did parks get formed and so on? Hmm. Um, where are they located? And so he broadens it. And so Cheryl and I, Cheryl T. Lixing and I, uh, continue to build on this. And I think in part because of my own training in Black cultural studies, I tended to foreground the question of representation. Hmm. So in addition to thinking about those kinds of measurable differences, like where does the where does a Black community live and where is a factory and you can measure it, I also wanted to ask about 
uh, narratives of race and difference that underpin policies and our very imagination of the natural world. Hmm. So in that book, a lot of, um, I think about half of the chapters really deal with questions like, you know, how do we, what do we mean by the environment? How do we imagine Im- environmental history? How is it recorded? How do we presume, you know, because there are, there are lots of kind of presumptions about who, you know, what kind of people, what kind of cultures are more polluting, you know, so all of these things are kind of framed through this historical narrative of race and the, and the sort of fact of colonization. So, um, you know, it's to think quite broadly about how race alongside gender, class, and sexuality really come to configure uh, environment, our environmental imaginations, and then subsequent to that, environmental policy and planning and so on. Hmm. So it's it's quite interesting how there was that, that broadening, and I want to get to that uh, in a little bit more depth in, in in a few minutes, and also ask you a little bit later about the the ideas of narratives of race um, and how that fits into positionality. But b- before we get there, says now you've worked with migrants uh, to Canada and migrant workers. I'm wondering if you have a sense of how environmental racism in this country might differ from other countries. So. Uh, as Andal mentioned, a lot of the examples that uh, that we, you know, maybe some of the students are more familiar with in the textbooks tend to be from the United States and tend to be focused on this idea of environmental pollution. So we we you know learn about um, African American communities in the Detroit area having to deal with contaminated water, or you know uh, the other example that often comes to mind is. Um, is you know pollution from in the air and water from um, refineries in you know Louisiana, California, communities predominantly made up by Latinx, Af- African American, and Asian communities. But these are all sort of cases in the in the U.S. What are some uh, examples of environmental racism or injustice in Canada that students should know of? Um, I think because. In Canada, in Canadian cities, we don't see the same kind of segregated um, community-specific neighborhoods that you see in some cities in the States that we tend to think we are not exposed in the same way to, for example, living around um, processing plants and things like that in, in the way that these case scenarios work. But So I think in Canada, a lot of hmm. the environmental justice tends to be Environmental racism tends to be invisibilized and hidden um, from the naked eye within a city context, although indigenous communities have been living with improper housing and access to clean water since the creation of the Canadian colonial state. But when it comes to migrant workers, I think COVID-19 has given us the perfect example where it's sort of blown open the way our society works by relying on racialized people to keep it going. And it's really pointed out how Mm. some people cannot afford or will not be afforded the same kind of precautions in, in this case, in a pandemic, Mm. but in reality, it's, it's always been the case. So um, we've seen, for example, Filipina caregivers, nannies, um, PSWs and nurses, face a large number of infections across the globe because um, they hold a lot of those positions and those are exactly the kind of workers that are not able to take physical distancing measures at all in their job. Similarly, migrant farm workers will not be able to take physical distancing measures or any kind of break from production because Food is so tied to seasonality in Canada. And so if we want to continue eating, we need to continue receiving uh, fruits, fruits and vegetables from farms across Ontario, across Canada, into their super, into our supermarkets so we can continue our lifestyle and continue to live in the cities. But mm. these workers mm. simply cannot take the kinds of precautions that we would be taking in an office setting. So for example, right now I work for a union and we are quite simply not allowed to come into work. And that's something that's been done to protect us from creating an environment in an office setting where we could be getting COVID-19. That is not something that could 
hmm. you know, even be discussed in a farm work setting, either out in the fields, but hmm. also in greenhouses, which is where we produce a lot of Canada's tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, in the fields, there's a lot of other fruits and vegetables and workers, not only that, but have been facing issues around inadequate, dangerous, unhealthy housing for decades now, for um, more than 50 years in Canada. But now we look at how that is actually preventing farms and farm workers from taking any of the necessary precautions around COVID because, you know, 20 to 50 guys will live in one bunkhouse or, you know, or women or people will share accommodations um, mm. in these specific ways that we are all freaking about right now with regard to COVID-19. Um, so imagine, you know, mm. those flights and planes that we're all freaked about taking right now, but, you know, that's where you live. You, you don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and so I think it's COVID-19 has really sort of taken away some of that, um, those covers that we have as a Canadian society around the real ways in which we put racialized people in dirty, dangerous, difficult jobs where they are in harm's way and where they're having to sacrifice their own health to continue to provide us with the infrastructure that, that allows the society to, to go on. I mean, if I can add to that, um, I do think students might be more familiar with American examples, not because it's they're less true in the Canadian context, because in practical terms, the Canadian Academy, I think, has been quite averse to supporting mm. anti-racist research. Mm. Uh, uh, Cheryl Tilexing and I had to fight really hard to even use the word environmental oh. racism in the title of our book. And in our workplaces as professors at the university, I mean, as a PhD student, I, um, the, the course in my own institution called Racism and Environmental Justice, uh, when I introduced that as a PhD student, there was a real reluctance by faculty, not just reluctance, there was like active opposition Jeez. to framing things around race because there's a story told that race applies in the United States, but not in Canada. Uh, but mm. mostly that's because we don't have enough research done. There's not enough, enough people doing the studies to provide the work to demonstrate it. I mean, very little work. Zazna's research on migrants, for example, uh, you know, does both things. It shows us how it shows us ways in which immigration and labor policy are measurably racist. Mm. How much people are paid, what kinds of work conditions are tolerated um, are for people who are racialized in particular ways. But it goes even further to demonstrate how these po policies have a long history of colonial racialized imagination, which reveals the seasonal agricultural workers program, for example, as the inheritance of slavery and indentureship. Like mm -hmm. we don't like to, we, you know, how could we in, in Ontario <laughs> think of migrant farm workers as having some kind of relationship to indentureship and slavery? Mm -hmm. But really that's the model, like in that, this, this kind of keeping people on a plan, you know, uh, mm. uh, uh, committed to the space they're working in, um, not you know making, not giving them any kind of status uh, when they come to Canada, not providing any kind of social support, and of course, like making them do work that Canadian they're doing this work because Canadians won't do it for the same conditions. Mm. Um, and you know this is this is all around. I mean, these are all racialized communities. So, you know, it's there. It's just that there's a real reluctance to, I think, to raise questions around the framework of racism. Hmm. That's quite interesting. And there's, there, there's a lot there and it's, it's, I'm a, um, blown away by the, the idea that there would be, you know, reluctance from, from an academic sense, but I'm glad you mentioned it. So that's it's something I'm, I'm learning and becoming aware of. Um, I, and it'd be really interesting. I, I do have a question later on about how that ties into sort of contemporary consciousness around issues of race and injustice, particularly in the wake of the of the you know the the rise of Black Lives Matter protests that are happening right now in the United States and in Canada. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll get back to that because I there's another theme that you guys both touched on, uh, which I think is a little bit uh, more foundational to the discussion before we we get to this, which is the sort of the colonial underpinnings of this theme in a Canadian context. Um, 
And so, you know, we do have this uh, historical pattern of colonialism and neocolonialism. I don't think that uh, shouldn't be a strange thing to say. And, it, you know, between the Canadian state and Indigenous peoples in particular in Canada. Um, and I think uh, I'm kind of curious to know whether that's a relationship that um, persists today in your mind. Is that is it fair to say that the, the Canadian state has always been environmentally racist? Is this something that is the case? I mean, there's a couple of things in there. One is, you know, Canada never went through an official decolonization process. The head of our state is still the queen of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, she's on our money. She, if I, when I became a Canadian citizen, um, I had to declare an oath of allegiance to the queen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in fact, Canada has never gone through, you know, I, as a Trinidadian who, you know, Britain colonized both Trinidad and Canada, Trinidad went through a decolonization process in which, you know, the queen no longer appears on the money. We don't, you know, it's it's not the head of state, but in Canada, officially, the queen remains head of state. And I think even as a symbolic value, it's kind of indicative of a, a kind of commitment to the colonial project. Hmm. So, I mean, that question is Canada. I, I'm not sure, how, on the other hand, how productive it is to ask hmm. that question hmm. because... You know, the colonization of indigenous people and the enslavement of Africans is foundation, foundational to the formation of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, that, that's, ba that's sort of a, the beginning of what the Americas is. It involves the displacement of the people who are here mm -hmm. and it becomes built through the labor put forward primarily by African slaves. Mm -hmm. However, that said, the danger in kind of reducing everything to a kind of grand moral condemnation sometimes I think prohibits the kind of bits and pieces work that actually activates colonization. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm less invested in saying Canada is racist or getting people to, that, that's not the, the goal for me. It's more to actively support research and activism, work like Zaznas, that challenges racism, that that counters the colonial project. And it begins, like, I, I also think, like, I went to high school in Canada. I did my undergrad in Canada. And by the end of that period, I know knew absolutely nothing hmm. about Indigenous peoples at that time. Hmm. And this is not so long ago. You know, this is the 90s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's incredible to me. Like, that does not indicate any kind of commitment to the colonial project when you're not even learning about the first peoples, you know, in your social, in your high schools, in your social science classes. Yeah. So I think we're very much at the beginning point. I think it's an exciting point right now. I think, um, you know, thanks to uh, both Indigenous and Black movements in particular in, in Canada and the United States and elsewhere, they've really put those questions uh, at the fore and pushed us to really confront uh, the fact that we haven't entered into kind of a serious decolonization process. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying to locate some of these, ex, you know, examples that I've become aware of in the last uh, couple of years um, and trying to, to, to frame it within the, the, the lens of an environmental injustice or a form of environmental racism or a form of environmental neocolonialism. So these are examples like we hear about um, the lack of clean drinking water in many First mm -hmm. Nations communities, um, the proximity of some of these communities to, of indigenous communities to forms of environmental pollution like uranium mining uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, oil sands production in Alberta, and even this question of like the safety around ruptured pipelines. And so for me, that's a really, vis it's a very clear cut link to that early definition of environmental Absolutely. Racism. Yes. Um, but I also take the point that that you know it, it isn't so necessarily so overt, and 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 says Na's point about how this is often you know made invisibilized or or uh, hidden in some uh, other respects. If I could add to what Andal was saying, something that's been very important for uh, some of us doing migrant justice work is to, and I myself immigrated to Canada at 18. And so, first of all, was equally surprised to see the Queen on official communications and realized that, you know, coming from a very different different colonial state, 
still a colonial state. Um, there was no discourse around independence or decolonization, not, not that that actually, you know, accomplished what it was meant to. But here, I think there's a big role for us to play when doing migrant justice work and being immigrants ourselves around um, not only learning the history of First Nations um, peoples in Canada, but also learning about Indigenous law in the regions and areas where we're working and trying to, in our work, respect law and traditional rules in the same breath as we do educational work around, for example, the Employment Standards Act, which um, covers workers in Ontario and provides uh, workers' rights. So, you know, and not to focus only on the pieces of the colonial state that on a day-to-day -day provide us with, uh, let's say, our rights in this context, but, you know, also doing the work of connecting with local indigenous communities in, for example, the farm farming areas where we do our work and um, including that in our education and in our organizing so that we're not just replicating hmm. and furthering the colonial project that is Canada and its legislation, um, hmm. but you know, also doing active work to redress that in our capacity. Can, can, Sazna, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of your work with Husistia and, and migrant laborers in, in the farming sector and maybe tie that into how that relates to questions of environmental justice across a sort of a, um, a range of, of, of identities, not just race, but gender and class inequality and so on and so forth? Yeah, um, so I started working with Justice for Migrant Workers maybe in 2007, so I had only been in Canada for a year or so. And um, Justicia does a lot of different kinds of work. It's a volunteer-run political collective um, with a relatively small budget, but a very long-standing historical presence in, in farm worker organizing in Ontario and in Canada. So Justicia's work involves outreach and education. So we've organized countless workshops and education sessions for migrant farm workers in Spanish, English, but also Thai, and Tagalog um, hmm. for people in southwestern Ontario mostly around workers' rights in general, be it human rights, health and safety, employment standards, and other related issues such as immigration and um, employment insurance, parental benefits, special benefits, things like that. So th things that you know workers require information about on a day-to-day -day basis and so that's our sort of education work um, and then in addition to that Justicia has undertaken a number of employer specific campaigns that you may or may not hear so much about because they're very localized and they're meant to pressure employers to provide certain changes for workers like for example safety equipment or proper isolation measures right now um, or facilitate workers being able to get to the doctor. Uh, but we have also undertaken broader political and policy-based campaigns around um, status for all, around um, open work permits, meaning you know we think that farm workers should not be tied to one employer, which they currently are, but they should be able to switch jobs if they want. And we think that that would provide workers with um, a huge relief when it comes to avoiding abuse and exploitation. Um, and so we've also engaged in sort of test litigation around human rights cases and health and safety cases, coroner's inquests, things like that, where we felt we could push the existing legislation to be a little bit less horrible around the coverage that farm workers receive. Um, I should note that farm workers in Ontario don't have access to minimum wage provisions. They don't have access to holiday pay. They don't have access to overtime pay. They also don't have collective bargaining rights, meaning they can't unionize or, you know, they could try to form an association, but there's no law saying that the employer has to come to the table in good faith to negotiate with them. Um, really 
huge disparities that exist within the legislation we've tried to work on hmm. through political campaigns as well as legislative processes. Um, you know, farming together with mining and construction have been declared some of the most dangerous occupations in Canada, and yet mining and construction have industry-specific protections that don't exist for farm work, partly because those workers can unionize and have very powerful unions that have pushed for systemic coverage for them in different ways that doesn't exist in farm work. But that's not a coincidence and it hasn't happened by mistake. These programs were created to imitate, as Andal said, plantation models and indentureship models because they knew they worked mm. in the sense that they were able to provide growers with huge amounts of profit. They were able to um, make workers very vulnerable and very exploitable and create a large exploitable workforce that can be turned around within a few days um, of people that would come up from Mexico and the Caribbean to do this work, but now also Thailand, Asia, uh, Asian countries, Central American countries. And um, it's just, you know, has boomed and it now includes so many other countries than, hmm. than the original few. And we see those farm workers hmm. getting in accidents and losing their lives in much, much higher rates than you would see mining and construction hmm. workers. I'm really glad you pointed out how COVID amplified, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ways in which uh, race and class were working, racism and class were working to uh, to make some people more vulnerable. You know, there was a kind of spate of coverage when there were these outbreaks at farms. Um, but in addition to that, you know, while people aren't flying anymore, Canada was still bringing in planes of people from the Caribbean. And mm -hmm. I think Mex I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it was also Mexico, Zazna, but yes. I'm guessing if they were coming from the Caribbean. So even while, you know, things were shut down for, quote, normal people, people who were vulnerable, who didn't have uh, economic opportunities, you know, we took advantage of that to continue to uh, to allow conditions that would, would and did expose a large number of farm workers to COVID-19. I mean, it really amplified, you know, COVID-19 tended to amplify those things that are, that, uh, are widespread in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, the people listening to the podcast are politics students. I'm sure one of the things they learn in political science is that politics is everywhere. So mm -hmm. you're always trying to think about what are the politics of the situation. Well, you know, the question of race is so much at the core of the existence of the Americas. It It is also something that, you know, tends to inform all kinds of relationships. So... You know, there's on the one hand these very specific ways that are tied to the kind of first measurable ways in which we saw environmental racism, but it's a really expansive field in which we see how particular investments in racial hierarchy organize our, our relationships to each other and our conditions of life. Hmm. So, so Andal, is that another way of saying, you know, uh, talking about racism and environmental racism and environmental injustice in a, as, as a systemic or structural problem. Um, and the, the thing that comes to mind in recent weeks, we uh, saw a lot of discussion in the popular media about this question of systemic racism in Canada. We heard political leaders mm -hmm. uh, like the Premier of Ontario and, and Premier of Quebec uh, and even the chief of the RCMP saying that, you know, the institutions that the law is not racist, cl you know, claiming that the law is blind to race, to gender and class differences. <laughs> I, I have a sense of what, what you, what you're, I, sh I have a sense that you share my skepticism of that, but I'm curious to yeah. hear you uh, elaborate a little bit more. And I know it ties into what, what says now was yeah. talking about, about yeah. the, the hidden nature of this. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when um, you know, when you asked earlier about, you know, is Canada a racist country? One of the reasons I find it a challenge, uh, not super uh, 
a super interesting answer to find is that it sets people up to feel like that, that is about kind of one's personality or one's behavior. So I mm. think when sometimes when we have a discussion of racism, if we talk about systemic, we're talking about systemic racism, and then the chief of the RCMP takes it on as a kind of personal attack. Mm-hmm. So then we're stuck with a conversation that doesn't move forward right. because you have analysts providing, you know, clear evidence of systemic racism. And then, but you find that the people so you want to j- engage only see it through kind of a moral conversation about who they are. Hmm. So, and I found, you know, I found that happens so much. I've been studying, you know, I've been studying race my whole life um, as a, well, all of my life as a, as a scholar. And that always seems to be a big challenge. Um, at the same time, for instance, if you're going to ask me about cancer, I would have very little to say. I'm not a specialist in the <laughs> field. I would leave it to the people who study cancer to talk about it hmm. and maybe take their analysis to heart. Hmm. So for instance, Doug Ford, the the people you've just named, as far as I know, are not people who have carefully studied what systemic racism is, Mm. how it works, what is the history of it, what are the ways in which it activates itself, how continuous it is through Mm. different kinds of institutional uh, processes and so on. So I think partly like when we have to, we just have to be kind of attentive and careful researchers when we're, mm. we're trying to weigh this okay what what happens when we study it rather than a kind of kind of quick trigger denunciation because i think often when you talk about you want to have a conversation about racism people there's a sense for some people to feel oh that's an attack on me so i have to yeah. immediately not listen and jump to say we're not racist mm. but it's really not about saying you know you are racist. It's really about documenting and then unpacking and resisting the racism that does fundamentally organize how we function as a society. That kind of links into an earlier comment you made about this sort of stereotypical Canadian aversion to being um, tied in with with a, a U.S. a quote unquote U.S. Right. problem. I'm using square quote uh, square quotes. Yeah. Here. I wonder if you know some of these examples of environmental racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe the more overt examples might mm-hmm. kind of be a way, you know, a way for us to talk about that, this, the quote unquote systemic structure or uh, systemic nature of environment of, of racism in, um, in a country like Canada, when it is uh, in a more overt case, like this, this can serve as an example of like, okay, this is a problem that is evident. We can see here in this example that, you know, this p- community is being treated or has a different experience merely because of, of where they happen to be and, and, and who they are, who they are. And yeah. uh, that is an example of systemic racism. That's right. an example of structural racism. Right. Frankly, after you've done work with farm workers, I think the only logical conclusion is that there is deeply entrenched systemic racism in Canada and that um, law and the legal system is, has often been in fact a mere formalization of violent colonial practices and of prejudice and of racist, racist beliefs, um, Mm. which, you know, is actually how the, one of the ways in which racist beliefs have become systematized is through legislation. So, if you take the farm worker program, um, even though a majority of program of program um, workers today are from Mexico, the program was created for Jamaican men in 66, 1966, to mirror a similar program that existed in the States where Jamaican workers cut sugarcane. And um, in the transcripts hmm. of elected Canadian elected officials at the time discussing whether or not this was a good idea, they openly talked about how they thought black men were more apt to do harsh work or work under hot and harsh conditions. And it's a prime example in which Mm. you see prejudiced and racist ideals become policy, become legislation, and in this case become one of the features of our immigration system, Mm. 
And similarly, um, living caregivers or the living caregiver program, there was a specific move to recruit Filipina women and people into the program because they were seen as more subdued and less problematic than black Caribbean women who had been coming to Canada to do the work of taking care of children, elderly and, and um, sick and disabled people. Because those women were organizing in Canada, they were demanding better rights. And so the notion that Asian women were less problematic or were less likely to demand better working conditions is actually what shaped what the Living Caregiver Program looked like, now called the Caregiver Program. And, you know, it's another huge permanent feature of our immigration system. And so, you know, if you look far back enough, you actually see how law is merely a formalization of some of those systems. And then in Ontario, they copied labor legislation from the United States when they first created workers' rights laws to cover people here. And that legislation was formed around a slavery and plantation model. And so workers like domestic workers, meaning those caregivers that I'm talking about, and farm workers had been excluded from U.S.-based legislation because previously those people had been slaves. And so in Ontario, we imported a legislative system that excludes the same categories of people through their occupation in a system that was built around slavery hmm. and has never redressed that through hmm. decades of liberal and conservative governments because it's too big a cash cow. Yeah, like that's what systemic means, right? Systemic means it's been put in place in law and institutions. And I think, you know, it's, that's the conversation you need to have rather yeah. than are you a personal, are you personally racist? Like, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, yeah. important too, but the bigger conversation, the conversation we need to get to is to examine the long legacy of institutionalizing racialized hierarchies of power through governance and um, all of its institutions. Hmm. So maybe uh, th this is an opportunity to talk about the institutionalization of um if not environmental environmental racism, uh, environmental injustice, or or maybe a lack of even just a lack of uh, attention to diversity in the field of eco politics, and this is a theme that you had uh, mentioned, Andel, at the beginning of the show. But I wanted to to use that as an as a a way to talk about the idea of positionality more broadly um, and how it might shape epistemology in the study of eco politics. So just as a bit of context. Um, when we had first planned a show, uh, or this show, uh, you know, it was part of a, uh, like many other themes, a standalone week in the, in the, the series, you know, and it was, it was planned for later on in the series. And we decided to move it up in part because we felt quite frankly, that environmental justice and unfortunately environmental racism is perhaps a more foundational theme in the history of environmental mm -hmm. politics in Canada not just as a, uh, you know, in, in practice and the material of it, but also as an object of study, right? So um, I say this because both Peter, my co-host Peter and I are white, we are both male. Um, and it was not lost on us that the guests that we are interviewing to help us guide us through a brief history of environmental politics in Canada as a field is also uh, white and male, and all three of us are, you know, ha have a certain positionality. We're all professors, albeit at you know, different stages in our career. And so, what that means, I think, is that the narrative that we present uh, is particular, you know, to uh, a particular uh, positionality. And I think it's fair to say that that is a, a form of a limitation. So, I'm curious to know. Um, and as a professor who's mm -hmm. studied this, you said you've been uh, examining this throughout your career. Can you touch on the challenge of teaching and learning and knowledge transfer in the field of environmental politics when there is uh, a disparity of voices or a lack of diversity uh, mm -hmm. from the narrative point of view, uh, from the storyteller's point of view? Um, and, and maybe you can link this into your, your project on, on narratives of race. Right. I mean, you know, in terms of telling the story of the, the history of environmental politics in Canada, for instance, 
you know, I think you could recognize there's not a great variation in the kinds of voices that are telling that story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and when I think about positionality, I don't think of it so much as the body itself, like there is something about you being white mm -hmm. and me being brown that then produces a different knowledge. But what it does is it comes out of different historical relationships. Right. So for instance, if you are telling the story from the position of uh, a point uh, of uh, a privileged position uh, in which you don't have to think about how uh, your racial identity might limit your access to things. Might you maybe uh, if we're talking about being a student in the class, maybe it's who you get mentored by, uh, what kind, who, which people you're learning about. Hmm. So there are all these things in which you maybe don't think about, and therefore don't it it doesn't come up in the work that you do in the storytelling. Hmm. And then often for people who have gone through a different experience from that, well, that will come out if they face different struggles and so on. I mean, right now we are only talking about systemic racism in Canada because of the work of Idle No More and Black Lives Matter chiefly. Mm -hmm. I think it's really only through mass organizing that's forced universities, for example, and those of us who are scholars in different fields to really take it seriously. Like, you know, the story, you know, Char the book Cheryl and I did, it, I mean, it's a decade old now, but it's also only a decade ago yeah. that we had to fight to use the word yeah. racism. Huh. Um, that course remains the only one in the faculty with the word in the title. Wow. You know, so this is really recent. And this is, I would say, um, in spite of the kind of scholarly commitment to not push the conversation. It hasn't, if you, um, so I think of positionality in terms of the position of power rather than positionality um, as it's sometimes explained as in um, uh, speaking as a person of color or speaking as a woman. There's nothing innately about being anything that's going to produce an analysis, hmm. but it's in your relationship and your to the kind of history of power that's going to produce may, maybe a different perspective. So if things are working to benefit you, you might not want to challenge those things. I think it's probably innately human to want to continue to do things that privilege you. Um, so you might not want to challenge that. But if you are working from a position where you are uh, coming from a history of exploitation, you might want to challenge that because things aren't fair. So you might want to have varied voices in the room. Hmm. Um, and so, so, you know, that's the main challenge. I think I can't think of any of the, at least in the social science disciplines in Canada that I would characterize as representative of the Canadian population. Like it certainly isn't at my university. Hmm. Um, so I, I think it's fair, it's fair to say that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that, you know, we, we benefit, we have a richer conversation if we have a more uh, diverse set of voices that are contributing to that narrative, that, that storyline. Well, um, I think we have, a, we have better research we have because better if research. we're only looking at the story from one point of view, mm -hmm. it's not very good research. Like mm -hmm. I think, I think that, be, that be, you know, that becomes for me the ultimate question. Like the, the interest in, in racism is not simply a kind of moral question. For me, the, the ultimate question is like, I'm just trying to respond to be to the to the material i want to be as thorough a researcher as i can be to represent the situation hmm. so race is such a key component of organizing life in you know a part of the world that's been colonized for 500 years and um in the, and in, among those countries in the americas very few of them have been independent for even a few decades i mean you know i mm. not to go back to the queen but <laughs> you know we're still like you know we're still in the beginning of this process yeah. so we really have to kind of just do doing good research means you have to ask questions about race hmm. that's a really good way to encapsulate it and i i want to turn to sasna and ask you know a similar type of question in the context of your own work. Um, maybe a way to ask this is what do we miss if the effort to re regulate labor rights or even the efforts to organize uh, labor rights fail to incorporate, uh, you know, a diversity of voices of a diversity of, uh, of, of positionalities? 
Well, I mean, I think you're asking the underlying question for all of Justicia's work. We are primarily a group of racialized women, queer, trans people, immigrant people who are doing this work, engaging with farm workers and undocumented workers. And what we've seen is that environmental racism, for example, gets completely missed in a labor-based analysis because simply put, labor spaces are very white traditionally and historically. Um, and I'm talking, for example, unions, labor councils, mm -hmm. Canadian Labor Congress. Um, and that's changed a lot throughout. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. changed a lot throughout the years, but traditionally, these issues of gender and race get missed completely. And so, for example, my research in my master's thesis with Andal was around a group of women, and cisgender and trans women, in the Leamington area who were fish fillers, migrant workers who were sexually harassed and assaulted by the employer, but also controlled, monitored, surveilled in their comings and goings and their daily lives, and also faced all the other issues that migrant workers face, precarity, recruitment fees, um, harassment from the recruiter, lower wages, dangerous, really dangerous working conditions. Um, and there, it was very clear to me how the way that you know, the women started a legal case around what had happened to them. And the folks who came to work with them from unions and from law firms that were actually exclusively white just missed so much of what these women were going through, were missing the gendered lens to even mm -hmm. know how to speak to someone who was a survivor of gender violence um, or what to do with the fact that, you know, some of these were queer and trans people and we're experiencing all kinds of harassment in the community. And it was just com completely ineffectual. And so in academic work, analyzing that, but also in our organizing work, if you don't bring those perspectives, you will miss things that are crucial and that were maybe the whole underlying crux for how this issue came to be, which was certainly the case for this group of workers. So I found, hmm. As you mentioned, that the academic work on migrant workers was mostly carried out by white folks, but that was not even my main problem. My main problem was that all of it was very victimizing. It approached workers still mm. as this sort, sort of racialized other, uh, you know, poor folks being subjects of violence and abuse who didn't have seemingly a choice in the matter. And so what I tried to do was focus on actually how much agency those people had in fighting back, um, despite all of the barriers and everything being stacked against them. And, uh, you know, recognizing all of the complicated, intricate dynamics that go on in people's lives that isn't just, you know, all of these poor people or, you know, sort of coming from that charity or that white savior model that, you know, actually filters into academia all too commonly. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I hate to to cut the conversation sh short because it's it's a, a fantastic, a fascinating discussion. Um, before I do sort of take us out, um, maybe just really quickly, so as now you you were just talking about some of your work, uh, uh, particularly during your, I think you were alluding to your your graduate studies. You, I had understand that you um, kind of turn that graduate work into a comic book and that that might be coming out soon. Is that somewhere, is there a place that listeners can kind of keep their eye on to, to see where that might come out? Um, yeah, I think keep an eye on justice for migrant workers, social media. And um, I'm trying to do a second edit on it so that it's the best it can be. So that's why it's not out yet, but I do hope to release it soon. <laughs> it's a really brilliant project because here is Asna telling the story in two-dimensional form and has brought much more complexity and respect for the human dignity of the characters than you mostly see in research. You know, that we see a kind of... Uh, 
a kind of blank figure often, as Asna just mentioned, in the way that people might talk about the farm worker. And instead, what she does with her project is really give us a sense that this is a complex human being with agency, with limitations, uh, with authority and knowledge, uh, and which is neither all about kind of, you know, a kind of uh, short-sighted celebration nor condemnation, but just kind of the full complexity of her characters. So um, I'm, sh- you know, and it's also like it, it speaks volumes about how much, how many different ways in which we can activate work in this moment to to document, challenge, question, fight against racism. Like for Zasna's uh, master's thesis, she produced. Mm-hmm this wonderful comic book. Well, make sure you, you do share, share that with us, uh, says now when it does come out and, uh, we'll be sure to put that on the, on the, uh, website. But for the meantime, people can keep an eye out to, uh, justicia, uh, for my workers. And, and, uh, hopefully that comic will be up there. And it's just an, an example to, uh, students listening out there that, you know, research, um, and scholarly works can take many different forms. Um, I, I, I hate to, to end things, uh, so early when we have, we seems like we could keep going and discuss a number of, uh, important themes here. Just really, um, wanted to reflect on a couple of quick things, uh, that construct about, you know, the, the, the 3d, uh, framework that you mentioned, uh, Sazna, um, and linking that into sort of workers' rights and questions of environmental justice was, I think, really useful. This idea of, of co- using COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, to reflect on on this myth of of the the great equalizer, I found that really interesting because we've seen a lot of discussion around climate change as this great e- uh, equalizer, which also is a tr- you know deeply problematic uh, mythology. Uh, and I, I think you guys really tied that in uh, very nicely. And then this discussion about positionality and, and perspective. So. Um, how, how, you know, a diversity of voices really enriches our perspective and enriches our work uh, in whatever field that may be, uh, including ecopolitics itself. So that wraps up the this episode of the Ecopolitics podcast. Uh, and for listeners out there, don't forget to check out other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And thanks once again. We'll chat soon. Mm-hmm.